What if I told you that even your so-called woke videos, it's nothing but a magic trick. Left hand is distracting you while the real magic is going on on the right hand, especially when it comes to this conversation about Easter. All right. I'm going to agree with a lot of the things that the woke videos, so-called woke videos are talking about. I hate that term now because it's been stolen and misused and abused. But that's another video later. But those videos do have a lot of great information in them. But it is the focus that we have on their information instead of realizing what the true information that we should be paying attention to. But that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, before I talk about anything, on my YouTube, like, subscribe, hit that bell notification button. I thank everybody who supports the channel. But continue to like the channel, grow, scroll the channel. We're at uh, 7,400 people right now. Let's see how quickly we can get to 10,000. Let's get to 10,000. If people on my other platforms who will only get the shorter version of this video, we just jump on over to YouTube, we will get to 10,000 just like that. So let's get to 10,000. Let's get to 10,000. So I thank you guys for it. So let's continue. Oh, and those who become members of the page and support the page financially, I greatly appreciate you guys. Uh, truly, truly, truly appreciate you. Easter, which is very interesting because there was a conversation that was going on this morning where it was referred to as Resurrection Sunday. Why are so many Christian people today running away from the term Easter and are utilizing the term Resurrection Sunday? And I would imagine that in the next 15 years or so, they're going to have difficulty with even calling it Resurrection Sunday. Before the Internet, if somebody wanted to study, study the origins of Easter, study pre, um, ancient religion, study what happened at the Nicene Council, they would have either had to go into the Vatican Library or go into a library, uh, go, to a, go through a class, go research, pull information from the Library of Congress, read books written by PhDs. They would have to have gone and done all of that. It took work. So most people didn't do it. They just went by whatever the television told them or whomever was in their life that seems to be intelligent. Maybe it's their pastor. Maybe it's their parents. This is what grandma and grandpa always did. But as the Internet has made, as someone said today, the lazy person can now go find information. It's made information available for the most laziest of people. More and more people now have access to information. With people having that access to information, it allows them to see that there were many, many, many spring goddesses whose names are similar to Easter, whether it's Hostera, whether it's uh, Esther, Ilnana, it doesn't matter. There's so many and many of them had the egg and many of them had the rabbit. Now, you can make a claim that the Anglo-Saxons recognize the bunny differently than from Ilnana or Esther, recognize the egg as a preserved item that they would eat on Easter Sunday. They would give gifts to the pastors, the priests, and that it had nothing to do with Esther or Ilnana or Ostera. There is a claim that you can make. The Easter Bunny came. I'm sure he did. What is that? Nothing. You're too young. But do you know where Easter comes from? All right, let's see it. Um, Jesus. <laughs> Duh. Kinda, for sure. Is there something I'm missing? Well, long before Jesus, Easter started out as a celebration of the spring equinox. Easter is a Christian adaptation of the Jewish Passover. So Easter did not even exist during the life of Jesus, and Easter certainly did not pre-exist Jesus. Oh, yeah. Pagans celebrated this rebirth by invoking Yostra. So a little background here. Uh, the majority of Christians refer to this holiday by some variation of the Hebrew word Pesach, which means Passover. In English and in German, we use some variation on this name Easter. And this name was adopted in the medieval period. And it came from the name of the month in which the holiday was celebrated. And the name of that month came from the name of this deity, Eostra, 
we have one primary text in all of antiquity that refers to this deity, and that is by a Christian monk who explained that that's where the name Easter comes from. And all he says about this deity, Eostra, is that they were celebrated in that month with feasts. That is the grand total of everything that is known about this deity. Anything stated beyond that, apart from that it probably has something to do with uh, spring or dawn based on the etymology of the name, is simply made up. So everything else in this video about how Eostra was celebrated is something that was made up and primarily by folklorists in the 19th century. Eostra. I love that name. She was powerful, yeah. She was the goddess of spring, dawn, and fertility. Oh, cutie. <laughs> she was a cutie. And fertility is important, you know? Gotta carry on the species, so they celebrated with chocolate. <laughs> right? Oh, something sweet, for sure. What? Well, to celebrate nature's rebirth, the pagans would hold festivals in April to celebrate this goddess. So this statement is the only part of this that is accurate because this is based on what Bede says, that in the month in which Easter was celebrated, they had festivals for this deity named Eostra, and Bede additionally says that they held feasts in their honor. Well, I love a festival. <laughs> what did they do? They had a lot of fun with each other. Ooh. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of fun? Uh, fertility fun. Fertility. Yeah. There are no data that support this. Oh. But what does this have to do with baby Jesus, do you ask? I do ask. Christianity slowly became the popular religion in Rome under Emperor Constantine, early 300 AD. Love that for Rome. Yeah, Constantine converted from paganism to Christianity in 312 AD, ending the persecution of Christians. Oh, I love that journey for Constantine. <laughs> But the majority of these Romans at this time were still pagan, and they held on to their traditions and their rituals. Well, the rituals sounded fun, so can't blame them. <laughs> Me either, honestly. <laughs> so instead of eliminating the spring equinox festivals completely, the Roman leaders just converted them to Christian rituals. So this is also not supported by any data. The celebration of Easter long predates Constantine's conversion, the legalization of Christianity, even Constantine's birth. In fact, at the Council of Nicaea, one of the big things that they tried to do was figure out a better way to calculate the date of Easter so that people all around Christendom can figure it out for themselves rather than wait for a festal letter to come from the leadership. Oh, so Jesus's rebirth symbolically took the place of nature's rebirth. Whoa. And the symbol of fertility was innocuously replaced by the symbol of the egg. Also not supported by any data, the egg has no relationship to Easter anywhere near the life of Constantine. It's in the medieval period when eggs began to be associated with the Lenten fast as the last treat before the fast began. And then because they kept for so much longer than the other foods that were prohibited during the fast, people had a lot of them around. So they began to be a traditional way to break the Lenten fast. And as a result of that, they began to be exchanged, they began to be decorated, and they later became central symbols of the celebration of Easter. <laughs> Whoa, I know. It's so clever. The Easter bunny? Well, bunnies multiply a lot and quickly. They're very fertile. Bingo. So this is also not accurate. The association of bunnies with Easter also comes from later medieval European Christianity and actually arises from the use of the bunny as a symbol of virginity and purity within medieval European Christianity. See, the European brown hare can conceive a second litter while it's still pregnant with the first, and so it can give birth to one litter and then too soon to have gone through the whole gestational period, give birth to another litter, which gives the impression of parthenogenesis or virgin birth. So they became symbols of the Virgin Mary and they were frequently depicted in artwork depicting the Virgin Mary and they would be painted white to symbolize virginity, virtue, purity. And because the uh, conception of Jesus was thought to have taken place around the spring equinox, around the celebration of the resurrection, that proximity gave way to the association of these bunnies with rebirth, with resurrection, and with the celebration of Easter. And that was mostly formalized in the 18th and 19th century. I love all of this new information. And Yostra, remember that goddess? How can I forget our queen? 
her animal symbol? A rabbit. Also not accurate. Uh, there are no associations of rabbits, eggs, birds with Aostra until those associations were created by folklorists in the 19th century. And if you want to see more information on that, as well as some misinformation about the origins of Christmas, my video number McClellan 1147 goes into more detail and also provides some sources. But it still goes back to those deities, whether it's the Germanic, Ostera, or anyone else. Now, that is still the left hand distracting you while the real magic is going on on the right hand. So people have been able to utilize the access of information that they now have from the internet to be able to realize that I want to maintain my religion, my Christianity, but I want to separate myself from the religious people and I want to become spiritual. So because I'm spiritual, I'm still going to worship and have this story, but I'm going to take away the egg. I'm going to take away the bunny. I'm going to take away the Easter dress, the Easter speech. I'm not even going to call it Easter anymore. I'm going to call it Resurrection Sunday because it's about the resurrection, because he lives, he rose. That's what I'm going to focus on. And that is fine, that is fine. Uh, it is good that people grow within their religion because maybe if they continue to grow, they will recognize even more things that they may need to avoid. And they may want to rethink many more concepts. Unlikely, because as we talk, hypnotic rhythm is a muffler. <sighs> Once you get into a hypnotic rhythm about something, it is very, 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 very difficult to change it. Now, that is not to say that there is something wrong with these people, that I have hatred for anybody. I do not. So before anybody comes on here and it's like, oh, yeah, you, you're so mean, being mean to these people, they're good people. This, many of these people are very good people. But it's just what I'm just what I want you to look at is how we make these shifts based on the availability of information. But we still try to maintain our hold on what we want to believe in. So back to Easter, right? So we got this sunrise service, which is definitely a pagan thing, but we want to make it into something that they want to make it into something that is we are because he rose on that morning. So they want to be up that morning. They want to climb. I live in Atlanta. They want to climb Stone Mountain in that morning because on that third day to which it could not have been third three days, if it was. It would be on Monday. Sunrise service would be tomorrow. It would not be today. But of course, it's today because Constantine said that they will worship on a Sunday. That he worshiped Sol Invictus. He worshiped Apollo. He worshiped Mithra. Their day of worship was a Sunday. So in Constantine ensured that the Christian church that would follow after him worshiped on a Sunday. It also came in line with Romans who all worshiped on Sundays. So I'm giving you the hints right now as to what the right hand is really doing. Worshiping on Sunday, not the resurrection, not the uh, egg or the bunny or Astara or Estora or Elnana. And speaking of Elnana and Demuzi, one of the left hand things is this. So there is a Sumerian slash Babylonian story. They're both of the same guys, just different names, where the Muzi is killed under a waterfall. The Muzi then goes to hell. He's judged and he's put on display, hung from a tree and put on display. Ilnana is so distraught. She kills herself. She goes down into hell, into hell. She's there for three days. During that three day time frame, Enlil slash Yahweh Jehovah, Enlil sees that all the crops are dying and of course the gods got to eat too remember they got and the angels came to visit abraham and he had to feed them but the gods got to eat too so enlil is like no this is not good so he goes down and he resurrects Dumuzi and ilnana on easter and the foliage and the life comes back there's uh what is it Perse uh, Perse or persephone Persephone, she's in hell with Hades for six months and then she comes back. And during the time frame she's gone, her mother Hera is so distraught. 
And then when Persephone comes back at Easter, when she's resurrected from hell at Easter because she ate while she was down in Hades, and that made meant that she had to stay there, but she, she gets to come back and stay with her mother, Hera, at the spring equinox, at Easter, and all the trees and the birds sing and the rabbits give birth and the foliage and the planting and all these things can begin again. Focusing on Persephone is the left hand. Focusing on the timing, what, what's going on in nature, that's the right hand. That's where the real magic is happening. That's where the real story is going on. That's where the real lesson is. No matter what historical, ancient group persons that you attach this worship of this worship at this time frame to be what you have to recognize is a couple of immediate things. One, every culture in the northern hemisphere, notice I'm saying northern hemisphere, has this worship at this time frame. Because the southern hemisphere, it is not the spring equinox, but the fall equinox. They're getting ready to go into winter on the southern hemisphere as we are going into summer in the northern hemisphere. So they're in, well, so they, let me rephrase that. They're going into fall, which then goes into winter. We're going into spring, which then goes into summer. They're getting ready to harvest on the southern hemisphere. We're getting, we, we are planting on the northern hemisphere. So the right hand is that all these cultures, all these religions created God imagery, God stories based on the ability to live. And what are the main things that we need in order to live, especially in ancient times? You needed the S-U-N, the sun, and you need the rebirth of your ability to plant. All these people were agricultural. All of them being agricultural, the cycles of seasons was vital to their survival. And in order to understand this cycle of their survival, how they survived the winter, they needed to create some type of God being in order to justify or explain why things are happening. But Coach Renz, you might say, those things were already explained, but Jesus didn't have nothing to do with that. What you're looking at is the formation of the Catholic Church at 325 at the Council of Nicaea. One of the very important things that they had to settle other than the Trinity, was the celebration of Easter. Bishop Alexander of Alexandria, Egypt, was in charge with keeping the date of Easter, making sure all the churches had Easter at the exact same time, because some people had Easter in early, in, in, earlier in April, some in, in late April, some had it in March, and they wanted all of them to be at the same time. What time frame was chosen? The time frame after the spring equinox. Once the day is longer than the night, when the sun has conquered the night and it's springtime and life comes about because the people of every region of, that nor of the Northern Hemisphere were already practicing that type of worship. They were already doing their spring flings, their spring cleaning, their spring planting, their birds are singing, the eggs are being laid. They were already doing that because we come from a culture, a history of people where they recognize nature. And let's get to the real magic where they recognize nature. And in nature, you can see that life begins at this time frame. This is when the birds lay their eggs. This is why eggs became a very important thing, because many animals that they would see laid eggs. Even in the ancient Egyptians for my comedic people, when the Ogdo uh, wanted to formalize the matter universe, they created the cosmic egg so that Ra can be born from the cosmic egg and manifest the matter universe. So the egg has always been important to every culture because everywhere around the world there are, bed, there are birds, there are reptiles, there are all kinds of animals that lay eggs. 
So eggs became a symbol of fertility for everyone around the world. And then gods and goddesses were then attached to those. So it is a symbol of fertility and rebirth of life because people feared the winter. People died during the winter. People felt like now we will survive a yet another year. And what brought that in was the sun outlasting the night. You all know the story, the stories of, of how the sun sets at the Southern Cross on December 21st, 20, no, 23rd, 22nd, 23rd, 22nd. And then it doesn't move south anymore for three days. So it is considered in the grave. And then on that December 25th, it begins to set a little bit to the north. And the days are now becoming longer than the night. And so the sun has been born at that time frame. And then it's been resurrected. And then it wins the battle over darkness at the spring equinox. And after winning the battle, now the sun is longer than the night because people fear the night. The end of the day, it is astro theology. It is the worship of the sun. But the sun was worshipped simply because without the sun, we have no life on this planet. I'm not saying the sun should be worshipped, but the sun should be venerated. It should be like, oh my goodness, thank I appreciate the sun. Because without the sun, we die. Without the seasons and us being able to plant, without planting, then our, those civilizations would not be able to survive. Our civilization would not be able to survive, even though they're getting pretty good at just manifesting food out of plastics and stuff. But that's a whole nother conversation as well. The matter, the fact of the matter is, it is, it's, it has always been and it always will be people recognizing that as humans in this matter form of reality, we need the sun to survive. We need the seasons in order to survive. We need the planting and the harvesting in order for us to survive. Without those things, we could not survive. It is one thing to respect them. It is a whole nother thing to worship them. There is absolutely nothing that we should be in worship of. Only thing we should be trying to do as far as that's concerned, as far as this conversation is connecting our. This matter body with our spiritual body that connects to the matter earth so we can connect to the spiritual universe. That's it. And one of the ways of doing that is understanding how nature functions, understanding how the universal laws function. I am not so much into astrology having so much power over me or determining certain things, but there are certain aspects of energy that from the planets and the moon and the sun that affects the earth. The sun affects the earth because depending upon the wobble of the earth and what, so what hemisphere you're in, you have different seasons and you do different things in those seasons in order to grow and manifest things on a matter plane. So therefore you do different things in season to manifest things on the spiritual plane especially the spiritual plane of inside of you, you, your spiritual consciousness of raising your spiritual consciousness. The moon affects the oceans in such a way in seasons that it creates waves and it creates tides. And that gives us added great storms and it gives us more. Uh, it, it makes our seasons more detailed. So because of that, then we give moon energy to certain things in different phases of the moon manifest manifest at different levels so we us coming into concert with that in a natural understanding in an intelligent understanding not a woo woo give me my here's my faith and i'm just going to believe that some half deity full deity because that was what the council of nicaea was about is he a half deity is he a full deity is he god indivisible or was god divisible all those kinds of conversations that's the left hand that's the left hand while those bishops were and were giving people the left hand, they was over there doing the magic with the right hand. And it was doing the, they was doing the manifesting with the right hand. They was able to right hand Christianity to become the most dominant religion in Rome. And then here it is today at its levels. Same thing happened with Islam. <sighs> so therefore, we have to focus on the right hand. And the right hand is that we're coming out of this darkness of consciousness. We're coming out of the, if you saw one of my other videos, the Amun, which is darkness, and into the Octen, which is the light. 
This is why Akhenaten specified that the Octen, the solar disk, is just a symbol to symbolize coming into a higher level of consciousness and that understanding. So focus, focus, focus on raising your consciousness, opening your chakras. We've talked about opening your chakras many times. It's a good concept of understanding. I am not telling you to become Buddhist or Hindu. I am just saying they, their concept of that understanding is all something that you understand within yourself, getting rid of fear, shame, doubt, guilt, lying to yourself, understanding how to truly love, um, seeing how all things are connected and, le and not holding on to earthly attachments. That is the true concept. Not so much as you got to meditate this way, you got to light this candle, you got to do that. No. It's understanding the deeper portions of all things that is what gets you to the higher level of consciousness where you can then see everything. And if, it, if, and if for no other reason, to just decrease your stress and live a happier life. Everybody doesn't have to become super scholastic, but just enough so that your life is just better and that you're happier and you have less stress in your life. You can find some true, true love in your life. You can enjoy life at its fullest instead of just all you do is work to live. You're working just to live. And I'm not saying live good. You're working just to be alive. But to open your chakras helps you so that you can actually just live and truly experience this. People are always saying we're spiritual beings having an earthly experience. But if all your earthly experience is work and go to sleep and try to have a little bit of fun and bills and stress and arguments and frustration... What earthly experience are you having that's worth you being here? If you're going to have an earthly experience as a spiritual being, then you have to be able to connect with nature, go out and do some grounding all the time, constantly. Go out in nature constantly. Be, be around people of like mind constantly. Be around people of love constantly. Being around that person constantly. Enjoying life, experiencing all the joys and hobbies and love of life, that would be a spiritual being having an earthly experience, not focusing on arguing and fussing and fighting and working, and that's it. But when we get caught with the left hand saying that, you know, Ilana, Demuzi, Istara, all that stuff, and we just want to argue those points instead of just recognizing that every culture at some point in their religion when it was more animism, said that the sun brings life spring happens generally at this time frame and this is when life happened this is when the new life is birthed and there's an energy about it let me connect with that energy so i can birth a new life in my life so the sun will rise in my life it's all about you it's not about a resurrection it's not about a deity it's not about a church. It's not about any of those things. It's all about you. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. Continue to support the channel. There's a like and subscribe button down now. I need y'all to hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell notification. And, and for everybody who gives a super thanks to this video, I want to say thank you. I give gratitude to it in advance. I appreciate it so very much. But y'all have a great day. And remember, you have to free yourself to be yourself. Because your greatness is non-negotiable. Good journey, good vibrations, good journey.